It's up to us to make a choice. We know what it's worth to save the earth. Come raise your voice. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Sanctum. A couple of uh, pieces I recently acquired and wanted to showcase here inspired me to put this episode together. And although most of those comic book covers back there feature Godzilla, King of the Monsters, this isn't going to be an entire Godzilla episode. We're going to focus on kaiju and, and Japanese monsters in general. And that is why we are entitling this episode, Summer... Of my giant kaiju. Now, growing up as a kid in the 70s, Godzilla was everywhere. There was a, a TV program on in my area where I grew up in syndication called Creature Double Feature. It was on WLVI TV 56, and it was on every Saturday afternoon, and they'd show two horror movies. And then sometimes early in the run, they would show another horror movie at night around 8 o'clock. And I would always beg my, my parents to stay up and, and watch a movie if I could. <laughs> But anyhow, Creature Double Feature, like all these monster movie shows that were on in the 70s, showed a combination of kaiju films, Japanese horror movies, Universal Monster Classics, American International Pictures Classics, like, you know, X the Man with the X-Ray Eyes, and a smattering of Hammer films here and there. So these movies heavily influenced who I am, obviously. And I remember the very first kaiju movie, as a matter of fact, one of the very first movies I saw on Creature Double Feature that I can remember seeing was War of the Gargantuas. And to that, to this day, that is my favorite kaiju film. Uh, I really love it. it. It's super creepy. And it, it scared the hell out of me as a kid. Uh, especially there's a scene where the green gargantua picks up a woman, puts her in his mouth and spits her out. And like the, I, I remember like the, the, the bones and the dress falling to the ground. It just, it just scared the crap out of me as a kid. And there was something so eerie about these movies and the way that though, you know, they didn't look fake to me as a kid. They seemed surreal almost because it was very much, you know, the music was very ominous. Even though there was miniatures, you could tell that everything looked real as opposed to CGI now, right? Everything is supposed to look real, but it, it seems fake. But you could tell that these were real, and that's what kind of threw me off, especially as a child, and, and the way they would lumber and move and, and, and go about. These Japanese horror movies always creeped me out. Another one that was in heavy rotation on Creature Double Feature that I would see over and over again is Attack of the Mushroom People, which is a fantastic film for, for what it is. I, I, that one always creeped me out as a kid but anyhow we're here to talk about kaiju and let's move on to our first piece here now surprisingly as much as i like kaiju and love these japanese horror movies i don't have a lot of kaiju stuff in my collection number one most of it is imported from japan and can be very expensive to acquire but i i do pick up pieces here and there of stuff that interests me and that i like and I've picked up stuff over the years. Now, this one is very special to me. I just picked this up recently. It was just recently released. And I, I think it's, they call it like a Safubi, which is sort of like a, a soft plastic toy. I, I may be wrong, but it's it's sort of a soft plastic vinyl figure. And this one is imported from Japan, but I got it for a decent price. And this one is very special to me 
because the very first Godzilla movie I saw was not Godzilla King of the Monsters. I did eventually see that on Creature Feature, but the first one and the one that played in heavy, heavy rotation on Creature Double Feature, it's even in the opening credits when they would show the sort of like teaser for what's coming in Creature Double Feature was Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, which now is known as Godzilla versus Hedorah. But at the time, it was Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, and it was the American International Pictures cut of the film. They, they acquired these some of these films, and they would dub them. And it was a really, really cool movie. A lot of people don't think it's one of the strongest in the series, but it's special to me because it's the first one I saw. And I find it very, very interesting. It's, it's you know, Godzilla is fighting this monster basically made of pollution, and it takes on different forms. It can fly... It's sort of this big, slimy, grotesque thing. And um, then the one thing I always remember about the film, and I, I wish they had it in the, the Criterion set. I did buy the Criterion set, but the Criterion set has all the Japanese dubs. It doesn't have the English dubs, which I wish they would have the original American International Pictures English dubs because there was something, that's the way I remember them, as, as cheesy as they are. That's the acting I remember in those films, and that's what I, I really wanted to see. So anyhow, they had a great song in that film called Save the Earth. I don't know if that was the original song, but it was it was this very cool thing. And, and the, the film is very trippy, very psychedelic. It's got this ecological, let's save the world message to it. Godzilla is a hero, and... The creature itself is super creepy, and the music was creepy in it too, if I remember. And if you look at him, I mean, he's got sort of these these vertical eyes, right? And he's very Cthulhu-esque, right? He's just this big pile of slime and goop. And I like this figure. It was it was pretty reasonably priced. It's got some cool paintwork on it there, as you can see. And it's the version of him when he's fighting Godzilla. He's not the, not the flying version. There is a flying version. Very limited movability on this. You can move the arms a little bit. You can see the tag. That's that's him from the movie right there. But that is the only so-called Safubi type piece that I have in my collection. And I had to have it because I had to have a smog monster. I'm going to call him the smog monster because that's what I've always known him as. And you know, it's just, I can have him fight Godzilla. The other thing about this movie that was really cool is it's the first Godzilla movie where I saw that they had Godzilla toys. There's a kid at the beginning, and he's got all sorts of Godzilla toys. Growing up in the 70s, we didn't have a lot of Godzilla toys. They weren't sort of shipped over here till later on. And um, this kid's got all sorts of stuff, and I was like, that's really cool. I, I wish I could get some of that stuff. There was like a sort of basic Godzilla that was made, but it kind of looked more like a generic Tyrannosaurus Rex or dragon type figure. It had like a hollow mouth and you could stick your finger in it. I never really liked it. and I, I'm sure I had one as a kid, but um, it wasn't until the late 70s when the coolest Godzilla piece came along. And I did have that. The Shogun Warriors. Guy King with rocket boosters. Great Mazinga with rocket launcher. Look, it's Godzilla! Is he friend or foe? You can decide. Wow. Launch his claw. Imagine his breath is a blast of fire. Good warning! The large Shogun Warriors and Godzilla. They're ready to strike when you are. The Shogun Warriors, Great Mazinga, Guy King, and Godzilla, each sold separately. Accessories not for use with smaller Shogun Warriors from Mattel. In the late 70s, Mattel acquired the licensing to some Japanese-style toys. They made these giant Shogun Warrior robot figures, and they included in the line Godzilla as well as Rodan. I wanted Rodan so bad, but he never sort of appeared in my area or in any of the toy stores I was at. But I remember one year for my birthday, my dad took me to Child World, and he said, you can pick out a couple of things. And I, one of the things I picked out was the Shogun Warriors Godzilla. Now, as you can see by this piece, it is not the giant Shogun Warriors Godzilla. It is the Super 7 
limited edition mini version of the Shogun Warriors Godzilla. But the box looks exactly like the version looked in the 70s. There he is with his little tongue sticking out. It says Godzilla, and you can see Shogun figures. They call it the reaction. And they do a, a perfect replica of what the box looked like back in the 70s, as I would have seen it on the shelf in Child World back then. And I remember it, just, just the size of it in the cart, and I couldn't wait to get it home. So let's open this baby up. He hasn't opened up. He just arrived. It was a very limited edition piece. It went on sale and it sold out in a couple of hours. I was lucky enough to be able to score one. So let's check him out. Here he is in all his glory. The three and three quarter inch replica of Mattel's Shogun Warrior Godzilla. Now this is the first time I've opened this piece since acquiring it. And it's bringing back all sorts of great memories. I really did love this piece. It was it was so great to have a Godzilla piece and for it to be like a giant sized figure, right? So that you could actually play Godzilla with your other figures, which I would do, you know, he would fight the Migos or the Star Wars figures. He would still tower over them all. Look at him. He's very cool looking. And then this was the thing. This would always break off. But that's how he spits his flames. <sighs> Dun, 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 dun. Very cool. And he would shoot his fist out. He would shoot his, his claw out or his hand. This one doesn't give you the option to do that. And surprisingly, I never lost the claw. I would always It would always be lost, but I would always find it because it was a, kind of a big piece as opposed to the Shogun Warriors where you would just lose the missiles and things along those lines. Now, the other thing is that these these toenails would always crack and break off. I think I lost a few of them. And the tail was hollow and would break off. His You could take it off. Um, I think that was for packaging purposes. It would come off and you could put it on. And it was hollow inside. And I was I would always hide action figures in there almost to make like Godzilla like he was a type of, of giant robot that people would fight. But look at that. It's sort of the squat, squat-nosed, you know, short-faced Godzilla. But it was kind of awesome to have this piece in the 70s. They did do a piece uh, for Comic-Con, I think, a few years back that was a complete replica of the full-size Shogun Warrior Godzilla, and that's kind of a rare piece to get. I mean, as, as this one sold out so quick, you can tell it's very popular. And on the back market, the original Godzilla pieces, are they're hard to come by complete. As I said, this piece is usually broken off. Sometimes the fist is missing or the tail is cracked or the toenails. So it's a tough piece to get. I wish I still had mine, but uh, like a lot of toys from my childhood, he's lost to the sands of time. But now, I've got this three and three quarter inch Godzilla to remember him by. And look, he can fight Adora. <laughs> Now, these are all recent acquisitions. I just got the Smog Monster and the Super 7 three, three and three quarter inch Godzilla in the last couple of weeks. I also picked up this fellow last month. This is the Playmates Jet Jaguar, or Jet Jaguar, depending on how you want to pronounce it. He was this cool giant robot that also showed up in a Godzilla movie. It was Godzilla versus Megalon, and that was another one that played in heavy rotation as a matter of fact, I remember that one being released in the theaters. It was one of the first ones, I think, to get a big release in U.S. theaters. And the thing that was so cool about it was the poster for it was ripping off the poster for Dino De Laurentiis' King Kong because it had Megalon and Godzilla on the World Trade Center fighting. And you would think if you saw that movie, that's what you were going to see. And there goes Jet Jaguar. Uh, it's a very kind of cheap piece. It's sort of soft vinyl, uh, an American version of Safubi, I guess. It doesn't stand up very well just because of the way he's posed. You can't pose his legs. He has some points of articulation. You can turn his waist. He can go this way. He can give you a little salute. He turns his head. But I had to have it because it's, it's a real cool 70s piece. And 
I always liked that that movie or that version. I have to lean the son of a bitch up over here. There he goes. All right. So that is the Playmates Jet Jaguar. Or Jet Jaguar. Is it Jaguar or Jaguar? Jaguar or Jaguar? Shitty footage alert. Shitty footage alert. Shitty footage alert. Shitty footage alert. Next up are the new Mego versions of Ultraman and Ultra 7. Now, I have to be honest, Ultraman did not play in my area as a kid, so I did not know about Ultraman until I got older. So I'm not a rabid Ultraman fan like some people are. I did pick up these new Mego figures because they're, they're very cool, and there's just something sometimes about, like I said, the Japanese superheroes or kaijus that, that's very, very cool. And these are really solid figures. And a few years ago, I did pick up a DVD set of Ultraman at Best Buy. And my daughter was quite young at the time, and she really loved watching it. So we would watch it a lot. There's a lot of kaiju, a lot of monsters in there. Very, very, you know, simple stories. Kind of along the lines of like a Power Rangers, I suppose. But I really dug it, and I thought it was cool. I haven't seen Ultra 7. Um, I know that Mill Creek has put out some great Blu-ray sets of all the Ultraman series. I did pick up Ultra Q because I've heard good things about it that it is along the lines of sort of a Outer Limits slash X-Files-esque Twilight zone type series, focusing more on supernatural and, and, and sort of paranormal type things. So I'm, I'm looking forward to watching that. But these are really two really cool figures. You've got Ultraman, and Ultraman's got a really cool theme song, of course. Really good sculpt on the head. I love like the silver hands and the silver on the costume. And I like that he's got these boots, these real heavy duty boots. He's a real heavy duty figure too. Really cool. And he's got the little jewel or whatever it is in the middle there. I mean, look at that. That really does speak 70s. It really it gives me all the sort of warm and fuzzy 70s feelings inside. And next we have Ultra 7 who actually has pupils on his eyes. And he's got his little jewel up top. And I'm sure that means something to people that are Ultraman and Ultra 7 fans. I'm I'm not a huge fan. I'm not not a, not a huge fan. I just haven't seen it as much. So I, I get to look forward to watching those. And I like that they gave him the sort of karate chop style hands so you can pose him in all these sort of... You know, the whole thing was the sound effects with those those movies as well. He's got little red booties, and he's got this cool, sleek, stylized uh, costume. Ultraman and Ultra 7. Pretty pretty good. I mean, they're, they're much better than that Jet Jaguar figure. I, I like the Jet Jaguar figure. I wish Numigo would do a Jet Jaguar. Jaguar? Jaguar. Last but not least, we have this cool figure of... Dai Meijin, or Meijin. This was a really cool series of movies. And this would play on Creature Feature too. and I always love this. So probably in order of, I love the Godzilla movies, but my favorite kaijus are War of the Gargantuas, Rodan, and Dai Meijin. The Dai Meijin movies were, he was sort of this Japanese version of Frankenstein or a golem. All the stories took place in, in feudal Japan. There's only three movies. The ones that were syndicated in the U.S. back in the day, there was only two. I don't think we ever saw the third one. But they took place in feudal Japan. There was usually warlords or samurais or some, some type of feudal you know, lord just being awful to the people in the land. And then eventually someone 
would pray to Daime Jean for vengeance, and he would come in at the last half and just wreak havoc. And he wasn't like a, a giant, giant-sized kaiju, as you can see from the, the figure he's holding. He was just sort of this, he was a big guy, but he wasn't, you know, Godzilla-esque or anything like that. And usually he was a statue, but the filming was amazing. And he had this sort of spike in his head that people would take out or you'd have to put back uh, in order to make him go back to sleep. And he would sort of just get this peaceful wooden face. And when he came to life, he would have this demonic face that he's got here. Now, the the spike broke off, as you can see. Uh, there is the wooden mask somewhere that came with this. This is a piece I picked up at a, a comic book convention probably back around 2002 or so. So I, I don't know the maker of it off the top of my head. And he's got the his victim there that he's holding. He's got his chains that he breaks. Really well put together piece. You can see that the chain mail armor and, and even, you know, look at the demon face on his buckle there. But if you have not seen the Daimei Jean movies, I highly suggest you seek those out. I know that Arrow just recently put out a box set of them, and um, I'm going to try and get them if I can. I do have a, an older Blu-ray version from uh, a few years back that has the original cuts. And again, they don't put these out with... A lot of them don't have the American dubs on them. I wish they did. I did pick up the Arrow Gamera set, which I have to check out. I've heard that's got some of the American dubs. Gamera was another one that was in heavy rotation and that I loved at the time. Uh, really, really, again, the, the kaiju stuff is just so surreal and bizarre when you're watching a dubbed version as a kid and you, you're just trying to make sense of what you're seeing. So one thing I'll leave you with is I, I did see uh, a couple of years back, I took my daughter to see the second Godzilla movie, not the first one with Brian Cranston. That was terrible. It was the second one. We went to the theater to see it. And I have to be honest, it was quite enjoyable and, and more so exposing her to Godzilla. And it was really cool. And I loved it when the theme from Godzilla kicked in, the original Godzilla theme, because the, I have always loved that even as a kid. And I've also loved the the march, the army march, the one that goes sort of Bum 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 harassed me and sent me letters and, and phone calls and such saying, please, Dr. Duran, more singing. I try and accommodate you every episode as best I can. But anyhow, uh, the, the, the reason I like this is because my daughter got very much into Godzilla and Kaiju and asking me about Kaiju and I would teach her who the different monsters were. Uh, one Easter, I filled her Easter egg with mini Godzillas and Rodans and Mecha Godzillas and the sort. She was drawing pictures of kaiju's at the time, and whenever we would go to the supermarket, she would put herself, you know, on the cart, and I would push her, holding her, and she would sing that song. She would sing the, you know, she would just hum it, and nothing warmed my heart more than that. Uh, of course, now she's not as into it as much. She's she's into different things, but she she still kind of likes it. And she'll sit down and watch a Godzilla movie with me from time to time. But um, this is my very humble kaiju collection. I, I'll, I'll pick up a few pieces here and there. But for the most part, um, other than the movies, this is most of the kaiju things from my collection. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please, if you enjoyed these episodes, leave us a comment. Hit like and subscribe. We love hearing from you. And I love learning about all these wonderful things from you guys as well. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, don't let the words get stuck in your throat. Be kind to one another. Tell the people you love you care about them. And I wish you all nothing but good things. Good things. And while you're at it, do what you can to save the earth.
Good night, ladies and gentlemen.